Hi YouTubers, Lonnie Clark again, that's for art. I'm going to read a chapter from uh, Pollution Control Through Nuclear uh, Pollution by um, Tamplin and Goffman. I don't know if I mentioned this, but this is um, Thomas Ackerman's. This is a silk screen, I think a discarded one, but I kept it. He sent it as shipping paper for his t-shirts when he sent me the t-shirts that had this logo on them. I sold them at the Post Ignorance Project the first event we did here in Eugene, we sold all the t-shirts. They sold like hotcakes. Um, but I kept this because I thought it was kind of poetic that it looks like Bigfoot's print, footprint. Doesn't that look like Bigfoot? Did to me anyways. And it covered up the word destroyer and it covered up the word Fukushima or Fukushima. And it allows us to think of a different word like destiny or something like that and create our own better idea. But I still liked it, and I thought I'd use it. I came up with this idea, so it's going to be my background right now when I'm reading the book. So enough of that, and I'm going to get on with reading the book. So this is on page 30, and it is a subtitle called Huge Ener Energy Supply Supports This New Technology. In the field associated with radiation and radioactivity, some of the important milestones are, are the discovery of the nucleus of the atom, the neutron, artificial radioactivity, nuclear fission, and the self-sustaining nuclear fission chain reaction. That's where Fukushima is, folks. The self-sustaining nuclear fission chain reaction. We got three of those going on right now. Seriously, three right now at least that we know about. Who knows how many there are, actually. The net result is that all these epical advances is that the net result of all these epical advances is that nuclear energy release is possible in fantastic quantities. And radioactive substances are available in massive abundance, packageable with a richness of varieties that put the famous Heim 57 to shame. Since good is up in this field, it is believed that the good must indeed be super marvelous, for the up is certainly astronomical. In the early stages of an area of science or science plus, excuse me, in the early stages of in an area of science or science plus its technological offshoot, the practitioners are not many, and rash as they may be, their small numbers preclude in general global consequences of stupidity and poor judgment. But as with technology itself, the practitioners themselves believe progress means more practitioners, more centers dedicated to the particular science and technology, more applications of the technology. This inevitable breeds more progress in the technology, the requirement for more pro, more practitioners, etc., in an ever upward spiral. That's exactly what's happening in nuclear. Somewhere in the chain of developments, the science or technology becomes consequential enough to require a public relations agency, a lobby for the activities. For small science or small technology, the professional associations and the business associations subserve these functions. In the field of radiation, radioactivity, and atomic energy, the phenomena comes, the phenomena comes to require the same Madison Avenue approach applied by Detroit as with the automobile. Wow. The time for the gallant night champion has arrived. It is too late for the small professional or business association. A gallant knight champions the new technology. The gallant knight approach can arise in either the private or public sector, depending on circumstances. The final result is the same. In either case, a super agency is the fundamental requirement. For the automobile, the super agency was achieved in the form of Detroit, a triumph, a, a triumvirate of corporations, aided by Madison Avenue and dedicated to bringing the supreme benefits of the automobile way of life to every hamlet in, in the land. 
So exquisite was this new way of life that the ultimate goal of success in life became the achievement of the two-car garage, the total obliteration of the landscape by the freeway, and the final denial even of maintaining the psychological integrity of man and his family in the absolute requirement to devote his resources to the care and feeding of the automobile. Surely the super agency Detroit did its job in ensuring the widest possible spread of this stunning technology unflinchingly and faithfully. In the field of radiation and atomic energy, the particular circumstance that a military application itself led to major parts of scientific technological spirals has dedicated the establishment of the requisite gallant knight super agency in the public sector rather than in the private sector. This was achieved by an act of Congress in the establishment of the Atomic Energy Commission with the specific mission in the non-military area of bringing benefits of the atom to the populace with what has become an afterthought due consideration for safety and health of the public. Huh. So read that as if there is a safe application of the atom. We don't know it. When Detroit exercised its role for promoter of the automobile, the issue of public health and safety was hardly noticed until recently, very late in the game. Conflict between promotion and regulation. The quest of regulation in relation to promotion hardly existed. In the establishment of the Atomic Energy Commission, due notice was given to the regulation part of the story because of the appreciated power of the technology itself. But one of the fundamental errors of history was made by the Congress in assigning one super agency both the role of promoter and regulator. Obvious as the conflict between the promotional and regulatory activities of the Atomic Energy Commission has become, there is vigorous denial by the AEC and by the Super Promotional Joint Committee of Atomic Energy that any conflict in these roles exists. Joint Committee means military, Joint Chiefs of Staff, that's part of that stuff. You, um, Unctuous statements of self-praising abound from both the AEC and JAE and psychophants are available within science and industry in abundance to confirm the mythology of a consistency in promotion and regulation. We shall return to this conflict later. Well, we probably still have that conflict considering what we just went through with what uh, Allison McFarland just telling Congress, sorry, we're not going to give you the documents. Nope. Not going to do it. No, we'll, we'll think about it. That's what she said. We'll, think, we'll, we'll consider what you've said to us. As a super agency dedicated to the widest spread of the new technology, the AEC has truly rivaled Detroit, figuratively and literally, unfortunately. The AEC has several product lines, as has Detroit, and it, and it is vigorous in merchandising all of them at once. Among these products are nuclear energy itself, available for both conversion to heat and electricity, atomic and hydrogen bombs, radiation sources, and radioactive substances by the car load. One criteria alone signals successful execution of its mission for the AEC, namely an ever-rising curve of output and distribution of all its product lines. Nuclear electricity is heralded as cheap, even though it is true, its true expense is hidden in fantastic overt and covert tax-supported subsidies and the necessities to kill uranium miners with lung cancer to achieve such cheapness. Nuclear electricity is pollution-free because its poisonous radioactive byproducts are not optically visible as are the belching columns of smoke from the poorly designed fossil fuel generating plants. Nuclear bombs, unpopular when exploded directly upon a population, still need merchandising. 
According to the AEC, there are relative few human needs that cannot be fulfilled with an appropriately designed nuclear explosive, atomic, or hydrogen. Canals can be dug, harbors created, mountains cut, mountain cuts made, rivers diverted, all with nuclear explosives, provided one doesn't look too deeply at the residual radioactivity spewed and strewn about the earth. And we can, thanks to the foresight and hard work of the AEC promoter, have all the harbors, canals, etc. that we want because nuclear bombs are now cheap. We're going to have simu si simulated yields of underground natural gas, oil from shale, and metals from ore deposits, all by exploding underground nuclear bombs. Hello, Texas! Never mind the radioactivity associated with the gas, the oil, and the metals recovered. Indeed, recently a major promise for ridding the earth of garbage has come from promoters of nuclear explosives via the technique of creating huge underground garbage pits by explosions of large nuclear bombs. And all of these fabulous benefits are upon us. We can have thousands of such explosions per year in an immediate future. Ding, ding, it presented itself. Hmm. With a, characteristic, with a characteristic frugality, the AEC promises it will stay economical. And, <laughs> like Armour's Pig, uses everything but the squeal. Its refuse byproducts are being made available in the form of radiation sources of great intensity and radioactive substances to assist every scientific, industrial, and medical endeavor. The curve of shipments of such radiation sources and radioactive substances rises annually, signaling great success in the frugal, frugal exploitation of byproduct of the technology. That a probable large and largely unknown fraction of the radiation and the radioactive finds radioactivity finds its way by numerous routes into the biosphere, including man in a cumulative fashion, is almost wholly overlooked for the recipients and users are licensed. <laughs> Good. Glad to know we're licensed. That's why we can overlook the radiation that's filling us up. So the gallant knight of atomic technology, the Atomic Energy Commission, fulfills its mission of, cha of champion of the technology with splendor, assisted by liberal use of tax dollars for massive public education in the parlance known as propaganda. The technology has a byproduct that is a hazard to man. The environmental crisis is upon us for every single for a very simple reason. Few technologies are free of side effects. Only recently have we come to realize that many of our technologies have side effects of such potential magnitude as to be capable of obliteration of massive segments, if not all, of our ecosystems. Atomic energy can be regarded as an archetype. Huh. Indeed, it is especially it is especially significant to consider radiation as a prime example because the lethal side effects were apparent shortly after Rowentgen's discovery of X-rays. Yet, in spite of this, there is not a shred of evidence that this long-standing knowledge was made by the development of atomic energy technology. One iota more rational, excuse me, I'm going to start from the beginning of that sentence. Yet in spite of this, there is not a shred of evidence that this long-standing technology has made the development of atomic energy technology one iota more rational than those with far more obscure side effects. How is it possible for the side effects to remain so poorly appreciated? That's what I was talking about tonight. We must recall the technology is wonderful and good is up. Thoroughly imbued with these items of knowledge, the super agency Gallant Knights feel deeply their responsibility to reassure the public 
that we can have the exquisite benefits and solve the side effect problems by devoted research and development. Right. As your child gets cancer, they'll figure it out. They're working on it, as the former senator from Oregon used to say. We're working on it. We'd go up to him and ask him about a problem, and he'd say, we're working on it. Chairman, oh, I'm going to stop soon. I see I'm at 15 minutes, so I'll finish the, this subchapter. Chairman Gwen T. Seaborg of AEC is expert in the reassurance approach to coping with side effects. We must learn to live with the atom wisely, he intones. And this we are doing, and this we are doing well. Well, fuck you. You're not doing. <laughs> Ugh. Other equally prominent atomic energy proponents tell us that undue harm can stifle progress. And progress has brought us all the fruits of civilization we have. Professor Edward Teller recently sought to ally the concern about radio radioactivity voiced by Senator Mike Gravel with the reassurance that our methods of getting radioactivity out of the people are improving all the time. If we expose people to radioactivity, we'll clean them up, Professor Teller assures us. At some stage in a technology such as atomic energy, the platitudinous reassurance approach suffices to quiet public fears, especially if the platitudes are repeated on a regular schedule. The difficulty for the technology arises, however, from the fact that the side effects are real and they fail to melt away under platitudinous reassurances. That is, the side effects are obvious and cannot forever escape public awareness. Precisely, this has happened in atomic energy, much to the consternation of the AEC, for it is a truly, for it truly is a nuisance in the path of its mission to bring society the blissful benefits of the atom. With that, I think I'll stop here. Ciao, you guys. Sweet dreams.